Hey! <laughs> good to see you, Mitch. How are you doing? And you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. You're looking good. I'm hanging in there. <laughs> good. Let's change this. Yeah, you know, you're looking great. That that that's where the magic happens, right there, huh? I, I, I'm putting it down to the camera, Adam. It's got nothing to do with me. I just I invested in a good camera. I'm not talking into the, the webcam. Uh, you know, I've, I've got my little setup here for my my backstage lockdown club, and that's part of the part of the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Well, good to see you. Just talk about how you've been how you've been holding up during this time and in, in general and and keeping yourself busy. We can talk about the backstage lockdown club as part of it, but you you seem to be doing well and, and adapted to this this new world. Well, I kind of, um, it's it's not that new to me. I mean, there are elements of this weird lockdown thing that are absolutely natural, you know, spending far too much time in this little box of mine here, uh, you know, creating music, that hasn't really changed. So it's not, it's not that different. The big difference for me is the touring. This is the, this will be the longest period that I've ever, been static since I started doing this as a profession and I was 18 then I'm now whatever I'm 67 now so I, that's a long time uh, to not be out there touring and you know doing stuff so that's been a very strange thing but this is something that I just thought initially uh, I was in I was in New Zealand when all of this kicked off back in in uh, February March I was touring there and uh, by the time I'd left New Zealand and landed in Australia to carry on the tour there, New Zealand had shut down. New Zealand already closed the borders, done the two week quarantine thing. And I was lucky to get back at the end of the uh, Australian tour. So I realized that, yeah, this might, this might be six months. And then recently I thought, this could be a year, this could be two years, this could be for a long time. So I kind of created this 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 club, this backstage lockdown club, so I can still keep in contact with people and they can keep in contact with me. Yeah, I was gonna say, how much of this is for you? How much of this is for your fans? It's, it's, it's a dual thing to make everybody kind of happy and get through this. I think it's 50-50. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that people have, have signed up to this and have logged on and, and they they kind of need this because, you know, I, I, have, the, I have the great facility to come in here and, and create you know, a lot of people are just stuck at home. So they're listening to music that's always made them feel good or they've done everything you can do on Netflix. You know, they've done every series, you know, they've, they've, they've binge watched and binge listened to everything. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky I can come in here and dabble away and create new things. Um, so so by doing the, doing the club, it's kind of keeping me on my toes. You know, if I go on tour, I tend to play, if you're with a band, you tend to play the same songs every night. It doesn't really change that much. So every couple of weeks when I do one of these things, I'm getting asked for songs that I can't remember, <laughs> songs that I have to go and relearn. Uh, you know, I've got to get the, uh, write the lyrics out on an iPad and put them next to me. It's a real challenge for me. So it's been really healthy, I think, in that way. Have you rediscovered some songs that maybe you have never played that you actually thought, oh my God, this is great. I should be doing this on the road when I, things return to normal. Loads of them. Um, I, I did, the last one I did of this was uh, 10 days ago or something. Mm -hmm. And it coincided with uh, the Berlin Wall coming down, the anniversary of the Berlin Wall. And I wrote this, this song, uh, Tumbling Down, um, as I sat and watched the wall come down in my studio back then. And I thought, well, it was a perfect time to sit down and, and perform this thing, which I don't think I'd really done acoustically before. So, uh, yeah, I've discovered a few things that I've had to relearn, but have adapted themselves incredibly well to this, this format. So, as I say, it's the, the you know, the, 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 the gauntlet has been thrown down every week. People saying, can you play this and can you play that? But equally so. I get some crazy people asking me to play seven minute long instrumentals <laughs> where I played all the instruments. How am I going to do that? I just can't, you know, it's physically impossible. That said, you, you've done well translating songs that were pretty much electronic or, or were very lush on record. And people have seen that you can turn these things into beautiful acoustic things. Talk about the joy in transforming a song into something really new when you do something like that. It must be a great experience for you as an artist. 
It is a great experience. I mean, it's been said many times. It's um, it's kind of separates the men from the boys or the the the, the, the women from the girls. Um, it, it, it's a sign of a good song if you can strip it right down to its absolute basics, which for someone like Elton John, you think, okay, that's easy. You know, that's how he wrote the song in the first place, just him and a piano or Billy Joel or any of those guys. Right. That, you know, they sit and create it uh, with the instrument. I don't. I create the songs either with a band, throwing ideas together, jamming them out, or in a studio like this, you know, one piece at a time, like a great big jigsaw puzzle. And then at the, the, at the end of a certain amount of time, you've got a finished song. Now, the challenge is, is the song good enough to take yeah. it all the way back and relearn it and play it on just an acoustic guitar? And sometimes, for me, that's a real surprise when it happens, and it happens well. And I really get into it, the fact that I don't need all the stuff that I've spent months and months and months dreaming up and creating all the melodies and counter melodies and structures and atmospheres, and you end up throwing it all away because it's just you with the guitar and an audience. And sometimes those things are better than the original recordings. And, and truthfully, and your voice, which I know we, we've talked about before, this great instrument that is the, the voice you have, it, it sounded so wonderful in some of these performances now. Just talk about that and just being able to kind of belt these things out, and the joy of still being able to do it and sometimes do it better than you did originally. But also sometimes worse. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an organ like anything. It's a, it's a human thing. And I don't, do, I've never done warm ups, I've never done any vocal exercises. I always find it funny at festivals uh, where backstage uh, the, 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 the dressing rooms aren't dressing rooms, they're just divided by a, a sheet of, you know, material. So you can hear everything that's going on. And all around me, there's people going, la, 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 doing all these things. <laughs> and I'm caught <clears throat> banging my chest and having a Pepsi, and then you walk on stage and, and just belt it out. I'm very, very lucky. I've abused my voice for such a long time. So I'm very lucky that I still have any kind of voice left. Um, but it's, it's, it's something that it grows older as you do. So my voice is now a bit deeper than it was. I can still get to the high notes if I run at the microphone. But, uh, but other than that, yeah, I'm very lucky. And speaking of festivals, you're, of course, the, the, the creator and originator of probably the best and most special festival of all time. If you can just put into words, having done Live Aid and Band Aid and all that, everything we're going through now, as someone who's an optimist, as someone who's helped the world for decades and continue to do so with, with monies from that, what are your words of, of optimism right now? How can people get through this? How can your fans get through this? What should people be doing and holding on to? Sometimes in the darkest moments, you know, a piece of music or an idea or, you know, spoken words will come along, someone will say something and things will fall in place. It just seems that, you know, with the, with the whole COVID situation and, uh, and I think maybe social media has got a lot to do with it as well. The world seems a very, very divided place. You know, we've, we've been in worse situations. We've been through, you know, world wars and still come out the other side of it. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit better for it. You know, we're, 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 we're more, uh, you know, we're, we're more aware of other people's needs and desires. Um, so even, even though this is a, a very dark time, it's also a very creative time. It's a time when you do have to think sideways, you have to think outside the box, all those dreadful cliches I'm just about to come out with. But, you know, it's, there's always something, you know, beyond this that maybe it's just out of reach right now, but will come along and it will change. Things will get better. And, you know, music for me, it does exactly what it did when I was a kid. You know, you put on a piece of music and you close your eyes and it takes you out of the reality you're in at that moment in time and transports you somewhere else. Maybe somewhere else on the other on the planet and somewhere else, maybe somewhere else that, that doesn't exist, but it takes you out of your reality, whatever that reality is. So I, I've got great hopes for the future. You know, I think people are basically good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, the, the good will always out always although the bad stuff might seem to be battering us down right now good will always shine through well said well said i was looking last night midget i was looking at anniversaries and things and things in your career and it just happened that yesterday was the anniversary of the quartet release it was uh october 15th 30, 38 years ago i believe so 
If I can ask you about that one, because that was uh, honestly the first album that turned me on to you and everything you did back in the time. And I still remember the first time I played that album on tape. What did that album mean for you? Maybe here in the States, it could have been a breakthrough in some ways here in the States with some of those songs. I think I think that, I think some of those songs did. It was Reap the Wild Wind and stuff like that. So they were very much tied in with the uh, the dearth of MTV and, and, and you know all of that, which we didn't have. We had we had all the we had the content for MTV, but we didn't have the vehicle. So uh, you guys were getting you know bomb, bombasted with uh, you know uh, all those Brits making these videos we couldn't show. Um, for me, I think it was the the change in producer. Uh, up to that point, we had done Vienna and Rage in Eden with the brilliant German producer, Connie Plank, uh, who had worked with Kraftwerk and Neu and all of that stuff, who was a very creative uh, left field producer. And all of a sudden we were working with Sir George Martin, you know, who had done uh, the Beatles. And you think, my God, this man is so ridiculously musical. Uh, so it, it was a very polished record. And in some ways, I wasn't really keen on that. I liked the roughness of the, the first two. But there was something magical about working with, you know, George Martin and Jeff Emmerich, the engineer, who were the team who did Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. Who would have thought, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the stuff of schoolboy dreams to be in a studio with these guys working on your music. So, yes, and it was the nearest that Ultravox ever got to any form of... Uh, success, commercial success, I suppose, in America. Um, you know, we, we got to be able to play two, three thousand capacity venues, um, but because uh, of the technology we were using, which is still very basic at the time, it meant we were still doing five hour sound checks. So we couldn't move on and, and open up for someone else in the sheds or open up and do festivals and things. We just physically couldn't do it. So we kind of stalemated at that point. My brother's always asking, you remember my brother is such a fan, he's always asking yeah. about Visions in Blue. Always ask Midge about Visions in Blue. He loves that song. So, ah, so he's, got, he's got good taste. I love Visions in Blue as well. And talk about this other anniversary now, of course, with this fabulous Vienna set that's out there now for people to get. Um, this is deluxe in so many ways. Just how proud you are of that album and how great this package is for people that want to experience Vienna anew. It's still, it's still a bit alien to try and, it, it, it doesn't roll off the tongue very easily, you know, 40th anniversary of the Vienna album. Um, but yeah, I'm immensely proud of it. Uh, it. Strangely, it's getting better reviews now than it did when it was first released. Uh, you know, people are citing it as a, as a benchmark, as a, you know, as a, as a, as a mark that, that was the, the standard for things to come. Uh, you know, we, we, we made an album in three weeks uh, with the most incredibly basic equipment, uh, you know, two synthesizers and a drum machine and some rock instruments, drums, bass and guitar and keyboards. That was it, and a violin. And we created something that people are still citing today as, as something quite special. The package I, I'm, I'm absolutely ecstatic with because I, I'm always very wary of people doing, you know, repackaging things because they tend to do them very badly, they do them very cheaply, uh, you know, as inexpensively as possible. They put bargain bin basement prices on it and throw it out there. Yeah. And of course, <clears throat> the Vienna uh, um, uh, 40th anniversary box set uh, has been done by Blue Raincoat, who are basically chrysalis, who we made the stuff for in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they've, they're as proud of it as we are. So when you look at this box set, which is just ridiculous, it's fantastic. I mean, there's something on there. There are two live recordings from 1980, uh, one from London and one uh, from uh, the outskirts of London, um, both recorded on the same tour, where we didn't have enough material to play a full set. So I'm singing some of the old Ultravox songs from you know, the John Fox days. And I, I, I forced myself to listen to these things. I don't like listening to my old stuff. And I forced myself to listen to these live recordings. And I was absolutely blown away by the energy, the sound, the power that Ultravox had. I've forgotten how, how strong a rock band Ultravox were. And you listen to this and it's vibrant and it's powerful and it steams ahead and it's atmospheric and... 
And I know the basic equipment we used and I know the problems we had. Nothing on tape, nothing, no backing tracks, no sequencers, no nothing. Four people playing this stuff live. And that is worth getting your hands on uh, alone. It's, 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 it's kind of outstanding, even though I say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you want more extra, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you'll never miss a video.